Now, in our shared commitment to equitable aging for all and our equity promise at NCOA, we've really looked closely at the lives we've been able to impact together. So together, we've measurably improved the health and economic security of over 26 million individuals. And it's of note that 70% of those individuals are women. Women at the intersection of race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, and geography. And so today we bring to you a keynote address straight from the White House. We are honored to introduce Jennifer Klein, Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Office on Gender Policy, the Gender Policy Council. The Council's mission is to advance gender equality and equality in both domestic and foreign policy, taking a whole-of-government approach to a range of issues, including economic security and health, with a particular focus on the barriers faced by women and girls at all ages and all life stages. The Council has worked to advance equity to those that face discrimination, including members of the Black, Hispanic, Native American, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and LGBTQ plus communities, and individuals with disabilities. Jennifer has a long history of working hard on these domestic and global issues using a gender lens throughout her career. She's advised several presidents on these issues and has served in a total of three presidential administrations. We are thrilled to have Jennifer with us straight from the White House today to share the latest and greatest in terms of the Gender Policy Council's efforts. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Ramsey, for your kind introduction, and thank you to the National Council on Aging for inviting me here today. Um, it's wonderful to be here with so many friends in this important work, and I also want to thank my HHS colleagues, Allison and Carrie, who you just heard from, who are tireless leaders on this, these important issues. Um, for the, I loved your introduction, and I feel like you did a great job um, talking about who I am, but also more importantly, who the Gender Policy Council, or what the Gender Policy Council is. And for those of you who are less familiar with uh, the, the council and our work, just a minute on that. Um, the President, President Biden created the Gender Policy Council in 2021, and as you've heard, our work includes a wide range of issues from women's health, to women's economic security, to ending gender-based violence. And all of this is grounded in a fundamental commitment to human rights and equal opportunity for all in the United States and around the world. I'm especially excited to be here today to talk a little bit more about some of the exciting work we're doing to close disparities in women's health research through the first ever White House initiative on women's health research. Women make up more than half the population, but for far too long, women's health research has been underfunded and understudied, which means that there are far too many still unanswered questions when it comes to women's health. As First Lady Dr. Jill Biden has said, if you ask any woman in America about her health care, she probably has a story to tell. We all know someone, and we may be that someone, who has gone to her doctor who leaves with more questions than answers from the woman who gets debilitating migraines but doesn't know why, to the woman whose heart attack isn't recognized because her symptoms don't look like those of a man. Those gaps have real consequences for women, our health, and the economy. And it's important to recognize that we've made tremendous progress over the last few decades from revolutionary discoveries in certain conditions affecting women, such as breast cancer, to increasing numbers of women enrolled in clinical trials but we still know far too little about how to prevent, diagnose, and treat a wide range of health conditions in women. From conditions that affect women uniquely, like endometriosis and fibroids, to conditions that affect women disproportionately, like Alzheimer's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, to conditions that affect women differently than men, like heart disease. To pioneer the next generation of discoveries and get women the answers that they deserve, the President and the First Lady launched the first ever White House Initiative on Women's Health Research, which aims to fundamentally change how we approach and fund women's health research across the lifespan. 
And really, since the initiative was announced by the President in November, Dr. Biden has really led the way. She's traveled the country from California to Illinois to Georgia to Massachusetts, touring research institutions and speaking directly with women and innovators about the need to transform women's health research. From lab tours to listening sessions, she's hearing firsthand about the cutting edge research that's possible when we invest in women's health and about what we must do to support the breakthroughs we need in critical areas like women's heart health. And in February, the First Lady announced the first ever Sprint for Women's Health at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, or ARPA-H, with a commitment of $100 million dedicated to transformative research and development in women's health. This new Sprint, we hope, will accelerate the new generation of discoveries from early stage research that will spark novel solutions to later stage developments that will bring cutting edge research to life in the form of new products and to treatment that will reach women even sooner because of ARPA-H support. And I must tell you, the excitement that we're seeing and hearing about this opportunity is really energizing the field. ARPA-H received an unprecedented number of submissions representing 45 states, the District of Columbia, and 34 countries from a mix of scientific visionaries from across the globe and across sectors. And these submissions are currently being reviewed by ARPA-H and other subject matter, matter experts now with awards that will be announced later this year. During the State of the Union, the President called on Congress to make a transformative investment of $12 billion in new funding for women's health research. These new funds would establish a central fund for women's health at the National Institutes of Health to advance an interdisciplinary research agenda and also to create a new nationwide network of research centers of excellence and innovation. And as we work with Congress to secure these investments, the administration is taking action right now to advance women's health research. In March, the President signed an executive order on women's health research and innovation that directs the most comprehensive set of executive actions ever taken to advance research on women's health. And through this executive order, the President is directing federal agencies to integrate women's health across the federal research portfolio and prioritize investments in women's health research. Um, with a focus on driving innovation through entities like the Small Business Innovation Research Program and the Department of Defense, in addition to the more classic research organizations that we all know about, uh, like the National Institutes of Health. The executive order also directs agencies to identify gaps in federal funding and report on their progress in improving women's health. And it contains a set of directives explicitly focused on galvanizing new research on women's midlife health, including conditions that often occur after menopause, like heart attacks, Alzheimer's, and osteoporosis. We suspect that this is the first time that an executive order has ever included the word menopause. And I will tell you that I have taken a personal point of pride in saying that word in the Oval Office. Um, and watched a few people, not the President of the United States, but a few other people sort of get a little blushy. Um, but we knew that it was critical to include because it's long past time to invest in the research needed to get women the answers they deserve at every stage of life. And in March, we also unveiled 20 new, more than 20 new actions and commitments from federal agencies. I'd like to highlight just a few examples of the work that's underway. The National Institutes of Health, for example, will launch a new NIH-wide effort to close gaps in women's health research across the lifespan. They're investing $200 million to catalyze interdisciplinary research, particularly on issues that cut across the traditional mandates of the institutes and centers at NIH. This means that NIH will support cross-cutting work to address women's health research gaps by breaking down silos and encouraging collaboration. This coordinated NIH-wide effort will make it even easier, for example, to launch ambitious research projects, such as research on the impact of perimenopause and menopause on heart health, brain health, and bone health. NIH is also launching its first ever Pathways to Prevention series on menopause and the treatment of menopausal symptoms. This evidence-based approach 
will help identify gaps in existing research and develop a roadmap that will help guide the field of menopause-related research going forward. The Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs are launching a new Women's Health Research Collaborative to explore opportunities to jointly advance women's health research and improve evidence-based care for service members and veterans. And the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will strengthen its processes to ensure that new medical services and technologies work well in women as applicable before being covered nationally through the Medicare program. This will help ensure that Medicare funds are used for treatments with sufficient evidence to show that they actually work in women who make up, as you've heard, more than half of the Medicare population. These are just some of the recent agency announcements, and this work is already underway, and agencies will continue to take additional action as they implement the President's executive order. This work is essential, and even as we advance bold solutions across the federal government, the initiative cannot transform women's health research alone. That's why the President and the, and the First Lady have called on Congress, philanthropy, the private sector, the scientific community, and research institutions, among others, to join us in taking urgent action to spur innovation and improve women's health. And we really look forward to working with all of you, the National Council on Aging, and all of you in this room on getting women the answers they deserve about their health, especially as they age. Our work to close women's uh, disparities in women's health research is also deeply aligned with the administration's overall agenda and key priorities, which are focused on ensuring the health, well-being, and economic security of women as they age. I heard as I came in some of the, um, the previous speakers, Allison in particular, talking about some of this work, so a little bit of this is repetitive, but it bears repeating. Um, I'm going to just highlight a few more uh, examples that really underscore the, uh, the President and the Vice President's commitment to lowering cost, costs, increasing access, and helping women age with health and dignity. First, President Biden is lowering health care costs. His Inflation Reduction Act took on Big Pharma and is already delivering results, including for the nearly 30 million women in Medicare Part D. From lowering caps on costs for covered insulin to $35 a month, to capping out-of-pocket prescription drug costs for Medicare enrollees at $2,000 annually in 2025, to negotiating the prices of prescription drugs for the first time, the administration is helping women and their families save money on the care they need, from treatment for cancer to asthma to autoimmune diseases. And of course, this benefits all Americans, including women, and maybe even especially critical for women. The people in this room know that women are more likely to live in poverty than men and significantly more likely to retire in poverty. Women also spend a larger portion of their income on health care costs compared to men and women with Medicare spend more out of pocket. And NCOA's What Women Say survey tells us that in the past year, 20% of women said they had to delay or not fill a prescription, skip doses, take less than they were prescribed, or stop taking a medication altogether because they simply could not afford it. These economic realities impact our health. 23% of women reported that their health got worse due to their inability to pay for treatment in the last year. And the gender wealth gap compound, compounds these challenges, and the gap accumulated over a lifetime is even greater for women of color. The President's historic reforms help women with Medicare save more money at a time in their lives when they need it the most. Second, we've made, as you heard, unprecedented investments in the care economy, an issue that many of us in this room, myself included, have been working on for decades. And in, in my case, as a living example of the sandwich generation, navigating and relying on it as well. Providing access to high quality care has been a central part of the President's agenda since the very beginning. And I will say, as I also heard Allison say, that's because all of you made it a priority. The American Rescue Plan made significant investments to strengthen home and community-based services including by raising wages for care workers and funding worker retention, recruitment, training, and other efforts to help keep providers staffed to improve services for seniors and individuals with disabilities. 
The American Rescue Plan also invested billions of dollars in child care, allowing child Hood educators and family child care providers keep their doors open during the pandemic and continue to serve families who needed it most. We understand just how important family caregivers are too and the hard work that is being done by family caregivers all across the country. So the administration has invested in the National Family Caregiver Support Program to provide counseling, training, and short-term relief to family and other informal care providers. Last April, the President signed a historic executive order, which included more than 50 directives to agencies to both improve care for families and support care workers and family caregivers. In this last year, agencies across the government have delivered on the President's commitment, from rules to reduce the cost of child care to supporting access to quality long-term care and nursing home care. At the same time, the President's fiscal year 25 budget calls on Congress to make the long-term investments that we know we need by investing $150 billion over the next decade to improve and expand Medicaid home care services, making it easier for seniors and people with disabilities to live, work, and participate in their communities, and by proposing a comprehensive national paid family and medical leave program. Finally, I could not leave here today without underscoring the President's steadfast commitment to protecting and strengthening Social Security, the bedrock of financial security for seniors. The President's fiscal year 2025 budget reinforces his commitment to protecting Social Security and working with Congress to strengthen the program for the long haul. The budget affirms our key principles of no benefit cuts, extending solvency, improving financial security for seniors and people with disabilities, and ensuring that Americans can access the benefits they've earned. That's, of course, in addition to the important work that the Social Security Administration has been doing to help keep the lowest income older adults keep more of their, social, their supplemental security income benefit, implementing cost of living adjustments and improving customer service by investing in technology and staff. And this administration stands ready to help Americans enter retirement more confidently. There's always more to say about the work we're doing on these issues and beyond, but I will end here with a heartfelt thanks uh, to you, to all of you on behalf of the administration. Thanks for the work you do all day, every day, in and out, to support your communities and your loved ones. Thanks for your expertise and your advocacy to improve the lives of older Americans all across the country. And I especially want to thank the caregivers and care workers uh, who are here today for your selfless, selfless dedication. Today and every day, we are fighting with you and fighting for you. So I hope the rest of the conference goes really well, and um, I look forward to hearing all about the work that you're doing in the months and years to come. Thank you.